Marvel Snap, May 16th, Patch Notes. We have Kitty Pride back. This one's been something that everybody knows about for a long time. Um, she didn't work. There was a bug with her implementation. It was like a technical barrier. She's back. She's free for everyone who had an account before today. And I think this is great. They've done a good job handling this. Um, not much else to say. Have fun playing Kitty, especially if you have Hitmonkey. Uh, she's great in bounce. Deck customization. I think this is a good thing that they have gone for, but the implementation's like a little bit uh, spotty. So this is this menu here, and now you can go in and edit the corresponding card back like you always could per deck, but you can also change your avatar and your title, uh, which is great. However, I think this UI element here is a little hard to sift through now. The decks are bigger because they're showing more information uh, with the title and with the portrait and everything else. So you get less on the screen at a time, but you can't really do anything else while you're parsing this. So I think make this larger, put an X in the corner and make this like pop up, take over the screen so you can parse, you know, nine or 12 decks at a time and just tab through a page, I think it would be a lot easier to interact with, and you're not losing anything because you can't use the background in this UI element anyways. So, I, I mean, seems like an easy fix. Uh, we have card drops. Um, Master Mold, Negasonic, and Nimrod went from Series 5 to 4, and I don't know that all of these were expected, necessarily. Um, and then we had some Series 4 to 3 drops, very unexpectedly. Um, I think Shadow King, Sauron, and Ghost, none of these were, were scheduled for this month to go yet. Um, but in Retaliation, uh, we have Darkhawk and Null staying in Series 4. So this is, I think, the biggest element of the patch that people are talking about. I have opinions on this. I think it is potentially not as bad as people think. But I also think that the way that they introduce this to us is, like inexcusable. I think having this announced on patch day when people have been used to the standard cadence of downships for eight months now, like it's been, I shouldn't say eight months, they didn't have this current system at the start of the game, but many months, like six months or something since the current series implementation has been in the game. Um, it's always been reliably like, you know, there are people who've made spreadsheets two months in series five and then three more months in series four and then it goes to series three and it's like this kind of dependable churn which i think it's good that they're moving away from that and i think this implementation may or may not be a good implementation of moving away from that system but i think it is inexcusable to just have this be a little line in the patch notes this is representative of a huge departure from the current system and this is specifically two cards that people have been waiting for. They're very popular, people want them. It's it's not a good way to implement this. And it was just dropped unexpectedly. I don't know. I was very excited to get Darkhawk today. It was with what we were expecting. The only Series 4 card that was going down to Series 3 that I didn't have, I stopped opening caches specifically so I wouldn't open Darkhawk. And I was really looking forward to getting these, and they're just not here. So we have a few more updates, but we have a second announcement that relates to this portion of the patch notes, so I'm going to dip over to um, here we have Marvel Snap News, which if y'all don't follow this channel, I don't follow this channel because I am banned on Twitter uh, for whatever reason. Um, it's a subject for another video or whatever, but... Anyways, this is a great Twitter account to follow if you're interested in getting updates on Marvel Snap related news. Basically, this is a uh, content creator and streamer who runs this and they just follow along and watch for content that's posted in the official Discord. And it's mostly developer like posts in that Discord that talk about any kind of game updates. And so we have one here. And this is basically them unpacking this series downshift uh, chaos of today's patch after the fact. So it's important to note for the timeline's sake and when we talk about the communication of this issue that this 
this uh, content of this tweet that was a post in their Discord happened after this release by an hour or a few hours. Uh, it was still, you know, this morning, patch day, but we have, so card acquisition updates. The next few months are going to be truly epic for Marvel Snap. We have a new mode coming called Conquest, whatever. Uh, we've talked about this before. We've seen a lot of questions and feedback about how we introduce new cards to Marvel Snap. With the next patch on the horizon, we'd like to share some updates about our plans to improve how you acquire new cards. Our goal over the next few months is to find ways for more people to get the chance to play with new cards more often. So the first thing here is flexible series release. We've heard many players express that releasing every new card in Series 5 is interfering with their ability to get excited about those releases. We don't want you to feel pressured to wait for series drops in order to enjoy the content, and we'd like you to be able to play with more new cards each month. Our goal is to make all new releases feel exciting, accessible, and impactful in Marvel Snap. So far, this is spot on. Tons of people complain about this. It is maybe the most complained about thing from what I see and from what I hear online. People talking about any new card is just difficult to feel excited about because you're working on catching up with big bads, and you know, you're kind of especially if you're free to play or you join the game after global launch or whatever, like, it's hard to catch up. I, myself, am still, you know, missing big bads. I bought Jeff, but I, you know, I don't have Kang yet. I don't have High Evo, and High Evo is supposedly going to be a big bad. Like, you're kind of playing catch up. And so buying new cards for a lot of people is pretty bad value with the system they have. So they're trying to address this. In our future seasons, we'll be experimenting with releasing some cards directly to Series 4. Great change. This is something a lot of people have been asking for. Cards that have come to Series 5 and really not sold any copies. People don't buy them with tokens. People aren't excited about them. Still gotta wait two months. If you are unlucky enough to pull a Series 5 that happens to be one of those cards, you know, you kind of feel slighted or cheated out of your good luck in the uh, collector's reserve system. Similarly, when those cards are in Series 4 for f three months, if you crack one of them then and you're missing an important Series 4 card that you don't have, then that also feels kind of bad. So releasing some cards directly to Series 4 will help this. It will make them more attainable and presumably come down to Series 3 faster. Uh, we believe releasing some cards at lower token costs will increase accessibility and excitement for new cards released each week. Sure. We'll be listening to feedback and find the right balance between Series 5 versus Series 4 releases. I think this is great. This is, so far, this is what people have been asking for. Then we have flexible series drops. In addition to modifying the release series for some cards, we'll also be taking a look at the series drop cadence for cards. Currently, all cards are on the same schedule, starting in Series 5, dropping to Series 4, and eventually 3. However, the reality is that not all cards created equal uh, created equally appealing to players. Going forward, we're going to exercise more flexibility in what card drop series, what cards drop series, and when. Sometimes this means preserving the series of a card, as is the case with Thanos and Galactus, so big bads. Other times, this means we may drop a card from series five all the way to series three because we simply want more people to experiment with it. So this is kind of an odd spot to be in, uh, because if you buy a new card and it's series five you're buying the ability to have that card early. And if it downshifts all the way to series three, suddenly you've spent, you know, 6K tokens on a card that is now free the next month. And when tokens aren't necessarily buying you a card that you must buy outside of big bads, right? You're paying to have the card early. So that changes here a little bit. It also says we may even skip a monthly series drop entirely when the meta looks fun and healthy. These decisions will be made on a card-by-card -card basis based on data and player feedback instead of applying a blanket rule to all cards. So this is kind of talking about what they did this patch, right? Cards staying in Series 4, Darkhawk and Null. So unexpectedly, we just got ourselves in a situation where two cards that everyone was kind of, you know, counting on, downshifting this month, just stayed in Series 4. And I think, I think the issue here is that we don't know how this implementation will look in practice, right? This is kind of a scary paragraph because it means that we are relying on 
trusting the devs to one make good decisions that are healthy for the game and not like you know trying just to over monetize the token shop and selling collector's reserves or collector's tokens um, but we also need to rely on whether or not they make the decisions you know intelligently and in good faith to the players we need to rely on their communication because this new system has the potential to be good or bad depending on how they use this flexibility that they're now giving themselves and the important thing to me is if you're going to be changing the series of cards in a way that is not predictable according to the calendars and the way that cards have been dropping in the past two months in series five three months in series four down to series three and then to stay there if that's no longer the case the key is good communication clear communication about what's happening and when so people can adapt and people can you know invest their tokens into things that matter and then don't subsequently feel terrible about doing it when that card becomes free a couple weeks later and the important thing here is that if we're saying this system is dependent on good communication they have completely dropped the ball and lost a lot of trust by doing this suddenly unexpectedly and with poor communication right darkhawk and null have already not series dropped unexpectedly in a system where we're saying okay this could be fine if the communication is good and the precedent that's being set on day zero is poor communication so i have some hopes for the system and i'll talk about that in a second but i think it is imperative that they do a great job with giving us heads up warning on cards coming out or not coming out or whatever the case is and communicating things in a way that people can say okay yeah i understand why this is happening i think this makes sense or doesn't make sense but either way i can plan accordingly right the worst thing that can happen here is people feeling unexpectedly slighted and i think that's what's happened to a lot of people today so whether or not this says this system ends up having the potential to be successful a lot of people are already upset by it um i think yeah I think there is a lot of potential here, but I think they have kind of dropped the ball from the start. So continuing on, in our upcoming series patch, we're dropping more cards into series three than ever before. In addition, some of the more impactful cards are staying in their current series for longer than expected. So here, this needed to have come out and been addressed earlier. The timing on this, as we said earlier, was, was really bad. They needed to have released this statement here and gotten this out to people ahead of time at least a couple days if not a week or more i have a feeling that they were still finalizing these changes debating exactly how they were going to implement these right up until the last second but this is what we got so we deal with it but um we'll see going forward so it says there are some fun cards in this drop we hope they inspire you to experiment with new decks so cards dropping series five to four master mold negasonic nimrod i think this was all expected Cards staying in Series 4, Darkhawk, Null, Shauna, Stature, Zabu, and Modok. Um, the last four were the expected cards. So we're kind of padding the numbers here, right? This sounds like a lot of, here's this, this, and this. And I'm glad they're going for, like, completionism in this uh, little note here. But the unexpected thing here was Darkhawk and Null staying in Series 4. And then cards dropping from Series 4 to 3. Uh, Sentry, Silver Surfer and dazzler i believe were all expected it might have just been two of these but two or three of these were expected and then i think it was uh maybe also shadow king but i think sauron and ghost were sauron was supposed to be next month under the old system and ghost was maybe even two months under the old system so this kind of caught a lot of people off guard and you're gonna hear a ton of people talking trash about this entire patch and everything about marvel snap based on this announcement and i think that is to some degree a slight overreaction in the sense that this is one element of the patch and there's a lot of good stuff here but i also think this was a major major blunder and if we're going to trust them to have better communication on this going forward this was not a good start so i think second dinner has a lot of work to do to earn back some of the lost trust from people 
about this change, and I can totally understand and empathize with people who are reacting very strongly to this because I think this was a big miss in the communication uh, regard. The next thing is great. Uh, series 3 card acquisition. In a previous patch, we made a few changes for Series 3 players that greatly increased their token earn rate and introduced a free seasonal choose your card section. This made new card releases more accessible to these players and ultimately re resulted in more cards being collected, but we've heard feedback that some players would still like the flexibility to use tokens for Series 3 cards. In, addi in addition to the choose your card section, we're adding a new way to collect Series 3 cards. In our June patch, we'll update the token shop to include a new section, Series 3 Mystery Card, this option will be available for a thousand tokens and can be purchased anytime you have enough tokens and unowned series three cards. So basically, instead of the old shop being every eight hours you could buy one card and it was frequently series three, now you still get the choose your own free series three card per month, which is widely speaking a good change, but in addition to that, you're going to be able to buy a mystery card, which I think it's good I think this is a fine addition from where we are now. I don't know that this is strictly better than the old system, where you could pay a thousand tokens to just buy a Series 3 card and check the shop and, you know, watch and wait for the cards you want. But I think this is a fair middle ground. If you feel like you're missing a lot of good Series 3 cards, the value of spending a thousand tokens on random Series 3 cards can be quite strong. You're only going to get a hundred of those tokens back at the end when you start unlocking um, your free, you know, free cards, or when you're done unlocking what would have been free cards and get tokens instead. But I think this is still a decent addition for people to catch up. If you join the game late and you're missing a lot of series three cards and you can't really fin finish out decks and you're earning, you know, five k tokens a month or whatever. This is a sizable increase to your account progression, and I think that's a good thing to have access to. If you've already got some key decks that you like, and the value of a mystery card is probably not that good for you, then maybe you just hold your tokens and buy Series 4 and 5, and I think that dynamic is reasonably interesting and compelling as a collection mechanic. I think this is a great place to be as a early Series 3 player, where you have some flexibility, you can choose what you want, maybe not exactly what you want, but you can choose to some degree if you want to speed boost your way through Series 3, or if you want to just target Series 4 and 5 cards that you maybe need to unlock a key deck or whatever. I think it's kind of a good middle ground. Uh, we also have more ways to earn tokens. Over the last couple of months, we've been making adjustments to increase the rate players are able to acquire tokens. We think there are more improvements to be made here. In the next few patches, we'll be introducing a couple more features that will reward more tokens to more players. Our goal is that these new features increase the flow of tokens. Players will be able to purchase more new cards more frequently. The first of these will be weekend missions. So I think this is a good um, like initiative to have more tokens. I think this will go hand in hand with some of the other stuff. And I'll talk about my take on the overall new system after. But they talk a little bit here about weekend missions, which is something people have been asking for for a while. The current implementation of quests is this sort of one, two, three, four, five, and you need to do five quests per box, which means you get six quests a day. These unlock on Tuesday if you bank your quests on Monday, which seems to be what most people do, it's what I do. You're done this on Friday night or Friday afternoon, and you kind of run a little bit of a content drought over the weekend in terms of getting new stuff and just generally having access to like an influx of resources and things to click and progression to make. The weekends are a little bit of a drought. So uh, three new weekend missions, win games to earn credits. So this is just everybody getting a little bit of an account boost, which I think is great. Hopefully this is a decent amount of credits and not just like have 100 credits or something, like a drop in the bucket. Uh, win games with season pass card to earn gold. So this is strictly, at least how it's how it's written here, strictly a benefit to if you buy the season pass, or I don't actually I don't think you can unlock the season pass while it's in the, the season pass card while it's in the season pass. So this is strictly if you buy the season pass and you play that card on the weekend to do the quest, you will earn extra gold. So it's a little bit more incentive to buy the season pass and also to use that card in your decks for the weekend. I think this is fine. I 
I'm a little worried about giving more and more resources to season pass people who are already kind of ahead in the card economy. I think that widening the gap of what people get when they pay versus what free-to-play players have access to can potentially push free-to-play players further behind, which may or may not lead to worse experience and smaller player base. However, whatever they need to do to monetize the game and make enough money to keep the game running is ultimately important and a metric that everyone should care about to some extent. I think there is a fine balance to be struck here. Obviously, the game needs to be profitable in order to continue to exist, and if you like playing this game, hopefully you want it to continue to exist. I think there is also a sweet spot where if they go too far to the other side and they over-monetize the game, it kind of loses some like playability, and there's a danger to that as well. So I don't know exactly what the numbers are going to be like on these. If paying gets you too much of an advantage, I think it starts to become a problem. I don't know that we're necessarily there yet, but I don't love the season pass being a strictly pay to access with real money, always advantage, and never getting that card otherwise, I think is a little bit unfortunate. And if they overtune it in that direction, it maybe makes it worse. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Season pass players get extra gold, essentially what this boils down to. And finally, win games with newly released card to earn tokens. So this is the uh, season pass, or, sorry, not the season pass, the weekly release. So I guess one, one week out of the, one week out of the month, this will potentially double dip on season passes. Because I don't know if, I haven't heard people talking about this yet, but basically what this is, if you play the weekly spotlight card, so the newest card to be added to the game on the weekend, and do this quest, you will get some amount of currency, uh, tokens for that matter, which means collector's tokens from my understanding. And the series five weekly spotlight card, the week after the season pass is typically last month's season pass. So this month, for instance, the first card you could have bought when the new season pass card was out was um, Hit Monkey, right? So this season pass, first first week, there was no no new card release except for Nebula, who was not in the shop, but she was in the Battle Pass bundle. And if you already had hit monkey from last month because you bought the season pass i believe you would then be eligible under the new system to earn these tokens unclear if it works that way for the season pass card or not we'll see but it sounds like it might and the rest of the time what this means is this current week is iron lad this is actually a bug howard the duck is in the shop now but uh, hasn't propagated to the weekly spotlight for some people uh, if I reload my game, it might fix, but imagine this is last week that we're talking about and Iron Lad was the hot new card. If you buy this on day one or, you know, week one or whatever, in time to do quests with Iron Lad that weekend, you will earn some amount of tokens back. So if this costs you 6k and let's say, for example's sake, you earn, I don't know, 500 tokens, right? You're essentially getting a rebate on buying the new card or cracking the new card in a pack if you're really lucky uh, or unlucky, depends. Uh, you will get some amount of tokens back. So this is like making the cadence of whaling or just buying a card on release, whether it's every card or just one card or whatever, makes it a little cheaper to stay in the loop. This is potentially going to result in people like buying the new card each week and then getting a small refund and then rolling that forward into the next week and like you know, buy the battle pass, buy a couple bundles, maybe you can get, I don't know, two out of three of the new cards, series five cards each month. So paint a picture here of, say you buy the battle pass, you get one new card, right? And say you get uh, all your quests done and you get your like 5k or 6k tokens in a month and that's your second new card. And then say you buy enough bundles to, you know, you're picking up the, where is it, Token Tuesday each week, and you're getting your account progression up by maybe burning a bit of gold, or you're getting some bundles like this that come with credits or whatever, and you're getting enough credits, uh, you're getting enough collector's tokens 
to get a second card each month. So now you're three out of four, right? And you're getting a small rebate each time. So I can see a world where this change makes it so people can like uh, whale on a budget, I guess, maybe hundred ish dollars a month, which is a lot of money for a card game like this. I think even the Battle Pass of 10 is a lot of money for a card game like this. Uh, in the broader sense of the world, I know it's very normalized within the concept of like this space. But if you are then, you know, buying a bundle or two here and there and getting maybe a bit of gold or whatever, and you're getting these rebates each week, I can see them putting people in a spot where they're getting the battle pass, they're buying two other cards, and they're only missing one card, whichever least desirable card uh, they, you know, want to skip for the month. And then at the next month, when that goes down to series four, they just open it in a cache, and they're perpetually uh, one card away from being series everything complete, right? I think that is maybe the intention of this, and if that price point is low enough that they can attract people, um, content creators, people who play a lot, think that it's worthwhile, you know, maybe that's how they want to monetize this shop. I think it is, uh, it's interesting. I'm curious to see what the, what the numbers look like on these. So, yeah, that's, that's the weekend missions. These are, there's a lot to unpack here. These could be very small and inconsequential. These could also be sizable in each category and make, you know, playing every day really worthwhile if the credits are high enough. Like, if they extrapolate these numbers, right? Uh, this is like 250 and then 300 and then 500, right? If they keep this trend going, which I doubt, but if they did, it would be like maybe 600, 700 or something. You're earning almost a full like card split every weekend from that. That could be sizable, right? Like the potential is there for this to matter. Um, but we'll have to see. That's the last thing here. So it says, thank you for the feedback and patience. We're continuing to make updates to Marvel Snap. We hope to make the game. We all play together for years to come. So, okay, cool. This to me is, the pacing on this is, is bad. I think this needed to be, this actually looks like it might've been last night. I don't know, but this was buried in the Discord and not like a blog release or something. Like, it's hard to parse this stuff. And I think the, this post was this morning. So yeah, I think, I'm gonna say this came out like late last night kind of thing. And then the patch came out this morning. But again, this is buried in the Discord and it gets piled under and you have to follow like third party Twitter accounts to get this info. So I think the communication could be a lot better. It is what it is though. Uh, we have a few more updates, and then I'll go back into this a little bit with the game client open. So we have rank mode, number of cubes required to rank up decrease from 10 to 7. So it, when you get 7 cubes, you go to the next rank. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and the number of bonus ranks gained when tiering up has been reduced from 5 to 3. So this is notably uh, easier to climb now than it used to be. Uh, some people have been mainly complaining about this. I've seen some people like, oh, they're going back on the other thing, but it takes, so it takes seven ranks right now, right? You used to, say you started a season at 70 and then you climbed up to 80 and then you jumped to 85, right? This is the, the start of the month experience for someone who got infinite in the previous season. Um, once you hit 85, you would need to earn 50 cubes to get to 90. But now, instead of going to 85, you would go to 83. So you'd need seven ranks, but each rank is only seven cubes. So it's 49 cubes total uh, to get from after hitting 80 to get to 90. So it's one cube faster. But notably, it is also 70 cubes to go from 70 to 80 instead of 100 cubes to go from 70 to 80. So you're saving 30 cubes worth of climb uh, to make those first 10 ranks, and then you save one cube per 10 set of ranks afterwards versus the old system. So this does make it 
like faster, not by a ton, but noticeably faster to earn cubes and go up. Uh, it also helps slightly in that the bonus you get is a smaller part of the overall climb, which means that if you have a bad string of games, it is slightly easier to recover versus before if you, you know, memed for a bit or whatever um, and had to recover those cubes because you are not losing out of a 50 pool, you're losing out of a, I don't know, 21 pool or whatever. Um, the climb is just generally a little easier and simpler. I think this is still fine. I personally, I think hitting infinite is like, if you have enough time to play a decent amount is not usually not that difficult. Um, and this is not everyone's experience, but I think the the more they do to make this climb shorter and easier the more i think they need a additional incentive to play after infinite because if we take this to the extreme and you get 100 cubes per game and it takes 100 cubes to go to infinite like one cube per rank and it takes a win streak of one game to go to infinite right like there's nothing to do once you get infinite so obviously they're not gonna they're not gonna go that extreme ever but the more they trend in that direction of making the climb easier the more necessary it becomes to have additional like leaderboards or some kind of incentives to keep playing after infinite because the value of playing ladder really tremendously decays after you hit infinite for me um we got a lot of audio and small game balance stuff. There's more after this, I think. Uh, nothing too exciting, but there's little UI tweaks here and there. Um, Kitty Pride is back. She now returns automatically. So that's worse. But when she returns to your hand, she gets plus two power. Instead of the old way where you had to return her with her ability to get plus two power. So the main... The main difference for this is you can play um, Beast and buff her for plus two and make her free for the rest of the game. So you don't lose out on stats on the turn you do that. I think this is fine, mostly. The biggest downside is that on turn six, if you're playing a Kitty Pride deck, you must cast Kitty Pride from your hand or you will not get any of her stats. So the old way, for instance, you could buff her and bounce her all the way up until, like, say, turn five, and then you could opt to leave her on the board and then play a six drop, for instance. That's no longer an option. So you can't, like, get her pretty big and buff her and whatever and then play, like, Arnim Zola, for instance, or whatever six drop you wanted. That's no longer an option. So you have to play her on the last turn of the game, which makes her a little bit more limited in scope, but... For the most part, bounce decks that are playing her don't super care. You're trying to spam as many cards on turn six to make your hit monkey large anyways. And if you've played Beast at some point in the game, you've definitely bounced your Kitty Pride and she's now zero mana anyway, so it's whatever. Um, I think this is fine. This was the result of a tech limitation for her old design to her new design, and it's part of why it took so long for her to come back in the game. She's free now for everyone who suffered suffered through this time period i know some people were genuinely like very excited about her and bought her right away and couldn't play her and that really sucks but for everyone else free series five card um crystal got buffed uh the old way you had to play her mid lane and then you would shuffle your hand in your deck and draw four card uh, three cards as a four four now she's just still a four four but each player draws a card i don't know exactly what kind of decks would use this now but she is playable she has a home I think maybe something with Psylocke or Zabu, where you can play her on turn three and then get a chance to draw an extra combo piece. I could see that being relevant, maybe in a Galactus shell or a Mr. Negative shell or something. 4-4 four, four stat line's pretty weak in Mr. Negative, but it is what it is. She has some synergies now. Card draw, strict card draw in this game is very rare, so even though your opponent also gets it, some decks maybe will go for this. Um... It's it's interesting. Uh, I'm glad to see this type of change. I think cards that see zero play should get reworks or buffs until they are at least fringe 
you know, edge case playable or something, which is probably where Crystal ends up. Uh, Wave, this is maybe the biggest balance patch change of this um, this patch. Uh, so 3-3, three, three, stats haven't changed. On reveal, instead, her old text was, next turn, cards in both players' hands cost 4, and now on reveal, all cards cost 4 until the end of next turn. So the templating has changed slightly. It is not clear at all that anything has changed based on the wording of the card, but... Um, the timing of when this cost change applies to cards is different now. So the way Wave used to work is she would set the cards to four and then other modifiers would affect the card afterwards. So it's kind of an order of operations type of thing. And basically Wave setting them to four first and then other things reducing them cheaper is how we end up with stuff like Death Wave or Wave on three plus uh, She-Hulk, uh, sorry, Wave on five plus like She-Hulk going from Four, two unspent energy brings her down to two, and now suddenly you can play a bunch of cards. Death, if four things had died and you play Wave, she's now free. So all of these cost reductions that interacted very advantageously with Wave uh, did so because Wave applied her cost changing v uh, effect first, and then other things uh, went on afterwards. Wave no longer works like that. She now applies her effect last, which is very relevant because she doesn't work with Death anymore. She doesn't work with uh, She-Hulk anymore. She also doesn't work with things like um, Miles or Stature. She applies after those. So even if a card has been discarded this game or a card moved last turn, Miles and Stature both cost four still, which is uh, very relevant for that meta terror of the last couple weeks, which was the Miles Stature Point Slam Zabu Darkhawk deck. Um, that lost some game in the face of Wave. I don't think the deck is uh, necessarily strictly gutted anymore, but the interaction is there, and the ability to play some of those cards is now worse, and the ability to counter, notably, those type of decks with Wave is big. Things like, you know, if you played Wave into a Sarah on turn 5, your opponent could play two cards on the last turn. That no longer works either. So there's no way to circumvent wave. You play wave, or your opponent plays wave, or whatever. The next turn, everything costs four, period. And I think that's a big deal. This change has been kind of on the horizon for a long time, and death wave deck is now essentially dead. Uh, wave has no interaction there. I think she still has a place. She's still a effective ramp tool in like a electro Sandman ramp type of deal. And she's notably an important control tool in decks that want to run a single card out on turn six that plays sort of for early game tempo. So like Doom Wave, a deck that's like, I'm going to play a strong early game and then play Wave on turn five with a two drop, maybe Death or, uh, sorry, uh, Jeff or something. And then on turn six, play Arrow or Doctor Doom or Leader, something that's going to close out the game where you're already ahead definitively I think a deck like that is maybe stands to benefit from the new wave design. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this. The death wave, though, notably is basically no longer functional um, because death and She-Hulk don't work with wave anymore. Uh, death got some amount of compensation, so she was basically best friends with wave before, and... I don't want to say any wave decks ran death, because they definitely didn't all, but any death decks definitely ran wave. And so because of that, now death is getting a one cost reduction, um, because she no longer works with wave. She's now a little easier to do on her own. So if you're just playing a classic destroy deck, death requires one less destruction to re reach whatever cost point, break point you were hoping to play her at. So destroy eight cards, and she's now free. This is most relevant, I would say, for Galactus decks, where getting death down to, like, two, for instance, and playing her alongside a Shang-Chi is really important. So you only have to destroy six cards instead of seven to do that now with your Galactus activation. Um, also, just, like, typical traditional death decks that play, like, Squirrel Girl, or maybe a Thanos Death that plays um, anything with a bunch of one-drops and a Killmonger, you can now get Death down the old-fashioned way a little easier uh, to compensate. This was a necessary change because 
Otherwise, death was just nerfed without deserving it because wave was the card they wanted to adjust. So I think this is fine. It makes the death wave deck still probably not playable anymore in any capacity, but we'll see uh, what this does for destroy package. This might need some love and what wave ends up showing up in in the future. I have a feeling this card is not gone. It's still a very powerful effect, but she is not going to be ubiquitous and played in all sorts of different decks anymore. And notably the like, uh, Moon Girl, Double She-Hulk, Infinite Magic type of deck is, you know, non-functional now. Wave is a very different card all of a sudden. Despite having no noticeable change in her text, it is different text, but it is not parsably different text. But huge implications here, and this is definitely the biggest part of the patch in-game-wise, I would say. Uh, finally, we have White Queen. Similar thing to Wave, her text changed slightly, uh, but in the opposite sense, uh, she didn't actually she doesn't actually do anything else differently. Um, but the templating changed a bit, and there is a minor implication of this. So she used to say draw a copy of the highest cost card in your op opponent's hand, which doesn't you don't actually draw it, so it doesn't really make sense. Now it says copy the highest cost card in your opponent's hand into your hand, which describes what White Queen has always done a little better. So that's nice, and. Um, they say here in the text, uh, ex it more accurately refre reflects what she actually does and how she interacts with cards like Widow's Bite. So you're not actually drawing the card, so using the word draw there is like kind of misleading, and they fix that. Um, there's a bunch of bug fixes. I don't think any of these have um, gameplay implications. They fix the mystery variant reward now. Finally, this was an issue for the last two months. Um, a lot of little UI tweaks and stuff I was talking about earlier. Um, token balance is visible. Jeff can move where he pleases after being returned to hand by beast. So that was actually a, a gameplay thing. Um, but yeah, for the most part, these aren't like gameplay relevant bugs. They're just like VFX bugs and stuff. Um, known issue list. I don't think there's a ton of gameplay stuff. I'm not going to read through all these, but you can check these online if you want to. Uh, free Series 3. Oh, this is a notable one. Free Series 3 card in the token shop appears to be claimable again for a short time. After Oh, this is actually not the one I thought it was. But the after a series downshift, the free card isn't available to claim until there's been a shop rotation for a decent chunk, but not all of the players. So that's a little misleading. Um, I saw a lot of people kind of freaking out about this today. I had the bug. I had to wait until afternoon when the shop refreshed and then my card was there. So if you're in that spot and you somehow didn't open the shop or whatever this morning, maybe it'll work for you at 8 p.m. tonight if you open it after a refresh. But anyways, that's the patch notes. So I want to spend a little bit of time before wrapping up this kind of segment about um, the patch to talk about what I think the design goals of the new system are and why I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of people are reacting very negatively to the news. I think the implementation of this and the communication were abysmal, and I think a lot of people are very justifiably mad. I don't think the system itself is necessarily terrible. It may be terrible. I don't want to claim to defend this system while we don't know details. I just want to express a sort of interpretation of what it could be, because it's very vague, but an interpretation of what it could be that I think has some amount of optimism and I am potentially looking forward to, but again, we'll have to see what they do with it. So I personally, I'm a free-to-play player, I'm Series 3 complete, I started at Global Launch. Those are three facts about my account and my progression that the things I'm going to say are loosely based on that perspective, but kind of try to be open to thinking about them through other lenses as well, and I'll explain a bit what I mean here in a second. So when I evaluate the card economy and the release schedule, I like to go to my account and click unowned so that I can see the cards I'm missing and uncheck all variants. So it's easy to parse the entirety of the card pool in this game. I think this is an important thing to do because it gives you some context over which cards you have and which cards you don't have. 
And so when I have this kind of sense of like, oh, I can't play this, that, whatever deck, right? It's kind of contextualizes it nicely to be able to see the cards I'm missing. And this is as a free to play player, mind you playing from day one, but I have not spent a single cent to play this game. I am only missing uh, 14 cards, right? And I'm pretty deep in my series four pity timer. So I typically, I'm missing roughly 15 cards at any given time, depending on where we are in the month to month cycle. Uh, right before the downshift, I'm usually missing the most cards, and then after the downshift, I'm missing the least cards, and they add new stuff, but it's usually 15 plus minus 3, 2 or 3, something in that range. So whenever I evaluate a change to the card economy and the card acquisition model in Marvel Snap, I like to look at this view of the collection and evaluate it from the perspective of what I think this will impact the missing cards how how will this change my collection in terms of which cards i don't have right one will the number of cards i'm missing go up i don't know quite yet if that's true or not they have tended to word this change in a way that makes me think they will more or less respect the cadence of the downshifts and not quite do them in such a predictable and regular manner, but still keep the total size of Series 5 and Series 4 about the same. I think if that's the case, the number of cards I'm missing shouldn't really change. If you're free to play and you've gotten Series 3 complete, after being Series 3 complete for a month or two or so, uh, you will probably trend towards the same amount of cards missing that I am, which is roughly 15. If you buy the battle pass, that number is more in the 10 range or maybe nine, uh, something around there, because typically you will have uh, four or five battle pass cards that you have unlocked by buying the battle pass that I don't as a free to play player. So that number, if you buy the battle pass and nothing else is somewhere in the 10 range. And if you wail, that number can be in the low single digits down to even zero, but probably more reasonably one uh, missing card. And if you don't do all your dailies and you're free to play and you kind of play here and there or whatever, then that number will be much higher. It is very difficult to evaluate the impact of a system on that metric for a player who doesn't optimize their like income within the, the quests and everything else. But that aside, I still think there are some benefits to that type of player. But regardless of what type of player you are and how much you spend or how invested you are in this game from a time perspective, I think the change to the system, as long as they don't let the uh, Series 4 and Series 5 card pools bloat by, you know, they didn't downshift Darkhawk, they didn't downshift Null, but instead we did get a downshift of other cards that were in Series 4 and they have indicated that they may additionally downshift cards directly from Series 5 to Series 3. So I think as long as the total size of the card pool doesn't change that much, I think the number of missing cards will remain the same. Or potentially, if you buy cards strategically, you may actually stand to have a greater portion of the card pool than under the current system. So how does that work? Well, I think if the way that they word these things is correct and accurate, if we go back to the patch notes here, uh, was it? No, it's maybe the other one. So th this is part of the problem, right, around communication. It's hard to know where, uh, here it is. Flexible series releases. Um, in, f in our future seasons, we'll be experimenting with releasing some cards directly to Series 4, starting with two cards released to Series 4 in June. So this leads me to believe, and they say, we believe releasing some cards at lower token costs will increase accessibility and experiment for new cards released each week. So this leads me to believe that the goal is to make new cards more accessible and enable people to buy new cards and choose which new cards they want out of the card pool. So 
if we look at my missing cards personally, there's one thing about all these cards, there's one thing that all these cards have in common, right? They are all new cards. And I use the term new loosely because Dark Hawk is the oldest card in this list by far. But these are all, relatively speaking, newer cards than the rest of the stuff in my collection. And I don't really have a ton of choice about which cards I don't have because, simply put, the newer a card is, the less likely I am to have it. And so I am basically at very low input in which cards I'm missing in my collection. I have very little agency over which cards I do have by the inverse of that sentiment. So I kind of just get whatever cards I have, and I have very little agency in deciding which cards those are. I think if cards are staying in series for longer, and we are incentivized to buy those particular cards, so Darkhawk, for instance, I don't know that we can necessarily use Darkhawk as a case study because this card is in its extra extra life, extra time in series four unexpectedly. But we're now going into sixth month of Darkhawk being in the game and it's still not a free card. Had we known in advance that this card was good and staying here for this long, we could plan our token purchases accordingly, right? If we're buying powerful, um, you know, hype cards that are released, getting a small rebate on them with the new weekend system, and then having those cards stay in higher pools for longer, and other cards are downshifting quicker, right? If we're buying cards under this premise, then potentially we stand to have more cards out of this total collection at any given time, right? If some cards are releasing direct to four and they're coming out cheaper, if some cards are, you know, very good, like big bad level, and we're buying those ones first and they're staying there for a long time, which we're already doing, there's some issues with the big bad system. But I think by some metric, we may end up with a situation after this system goes into place that if communication is good and the cards downshifting are somewhat predictable, even if they are not a rigid, you know, two months and then three months and then free. I think there is a potential for this system to end up with players having more cards and players being able to buy cards reliably from series four, especially if they're new players. So I think there is some metric by which a card being good and a card staying in series four for a little while gives people a chance to buy it for 3k tokens rather than relying on getting it randomly or getting it as their one free card per month. Not that that's necessarily a good thing, but I think taken with all of the other things surrounding this patch, I think there is potential that people end up with slightly larger slice of the collection filled in and access to cards that they want in a way that benefits the players. Now, again, I will say this is speculative based on my interpretation of the patch notes. If the communication surrounding when cards downshift, why cards downshift, and how long they may or may not spend in particular tiers, if this is done poorly, this system can be abysmal. It will result in people spending 6k tokens on a card that downshifts to series 3 and becomes free the next week, right? Those type of stories are definitely going to happen. There's only so much that people can do to, like devs can do, to give players a heads up on what's happening because I know a lot of people who play this game that don't even read the patch notes, must much less keep up with the Discord and the third-party Twitters and everything else. So the results of this are going to have misses for people no matter how good of a job they do with communication. But I think there's potential if they communicate poorly across the board and even the most dedicated people are incapable of following and keeping up with what's going on because the devs just straight up don't post anything until after the fact, I think the system has the potential to be hot garbage. I think there is a, you know, strong non-zero potential of that happening. 
but I also see potentially a good thing on the horizon if they are able to communicate clearly what's going on and why and make people feel like they have some choice in what cards they get rather than just strictly you don't get the new stuff and that's the end of the story because that's what we have now and that really sucks like I would love to have Nebula. I would love to have Darkhawk and Hitmonkey and Zabu and Stature, right? I'd be down for Iron Lad. I might play Discard if I had Modok. The thing all of these cards have in common is that they're fairly new, and I have not yet had the chance to get them. I think this system has at least some potential to make that a little bit better, but we will have to see how it comes across over the next month or two as the new series downshifts go next month and the one after, and as cards are introduced in series four, or maybe someday direct to series three, who knows? I think there is a lot of potential here, and this patch is kind of scary because we don't necessarily know the implications of what's going on, but we do know that we're gonna need good communication around whatever happens because they're giving themselves a lot more room to go off script and they've also introduced the patch where they're, they've given themselves room to go off script with poor communication. That is setting a bad precedent. So they've got a lot of work to do to overcome that, but I think it is possible. So we'll see. Anyways, I think that's probably long enough rambling about the, um, the patch for today. 